and welcome to FPL Mates, your best made for fantasy Premier League content for the 2022-23 season. My name is Dan and it's time for our Game Week 35 team selection video where I'm going to be showing you my scores from Game Week 34 as well as my plans moving forward for the final four Game Weeks of this season. I can't believe we are so close to the end now guys. If you do enjoy this one, please do drop a like, do subscribe if you're new around here. Without further ado, let's have a look at my Game Week 34. All right, so mixed emotions for Game Week 34 for me. 110 points was the final score without any hits, and it's given me a, a very, very small baby, tiny little uh, green arrow. A very small one, but a green arrow nonetheless. And in many ways, I feel quite fortunate to have that green arrow because I did make a couple of conscious decisions that didn't quite work out. First of all, I decided to go without Mo Salah. I noticed that his numbers have been dropping recently. He's been playing quite wide and not shooting as much as I'd like him to be. Now, we did see a reoccurrence of that in in game week 34 but two penalties meant he ended up with a really really nice score so without him in my team it was a bit of a struggle to catch up with the kind of overall score the average score that a lot of other people had my other decision was to bring in Diogo Jota which was again a little bit unfortunate there because he was unavailable for the first game came on got a yellow card could have possibly been sent off did score that goal in the end uh, but then after that he did have a reoccurrence of his back injury and I believe he's got another minor injury now as well so it's it's not looking too good for Jota and that punt really didn't pay off but I did get a little bit of respite in the end with a lucky McAllister penalty right at the last minute of the Manchester United game that really did claw back my game week save my game week and does kind of show that luck can go both ways and often it does average out by the end of the season so I'm not too disappointed overall I'm pretty happy with the team that I've got I'm very glad that I get to keep these players for future game weeks I was impressed by a lot of the the players that, that I had for my team so Overall, uh, I think we are okay. It could have been a bigger green arrow. Maybe the punts could have worked out a little bit better. But I do still want to keep pushing. Keep, keep being very aggressive for the last few game weeks. Because there's not much time to finish on my target rank of 50,000. I've got... 929 29,000 uh, places to catch up on. Can I do it? I think I can. But we are going to have to make some big, bold moves. So that's what we're going to talk about next. All right, one free transfer, 1.3 million in the bank. Let's line up my team. And I'm going to start off in goal with Edison. And I know Edison was dropped for the last game. We're not exactly sure whether he's going to be straight back in the team. But the benefits of a goalkeeper is that if they don't start the match, they probably don't finish the match either. So you will have your bench goalkeeper come straight on. My bench goalkeeper is Kepa against Bournemouth. But I do think Bournemouth will score against Chelsea. And I feel like Edison, if he can get a start against Leeds, the clean sheet is very, very much on the cards. Uh, I know that Edison doesn't usually keep a clean sheet, but we saw Man City keep a clean sheet without him. Maybe they can do it with him as well. But it's going to be kind of down to fate who my goalkeeper is this week. I would like to start with Edison if he is going to be playing. But if he's not, because we're on a single game week, I don't need to worry too much about rotation in this kind of uh, in this kind of scenario. So overall, I'm happy to roll with Edison against Leeds. Hopefully Leeds will be a little bit more defensive under the new management of Allardyce as well. So maybe that's going to make a slight difference. So yeah, let's see if we can get ourselves a clean sheet. Next up, Trent Alexander-Arnold in defence. One of the only defenders who is actually getting attacking returns at the moment there's a couple others but attacking returns seem to be difficult to come by or specifically 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 difficult to identify and predict which defender is going to get the attacking return but with Trent it's actually been pretty reliable recently playing in that kind of more midfield position recently putting in plenty of passes and we are seeing a return of the Trent of old where he is providing that creativity to his team so even though it's a game against Brentford I imagine they will sit fairly deep so maybe it could be a low scoring game potentially and if so can we uh, can we avoid lots of goals being scored against Trent maybe you never fully know with Liverpool but what we can say is that Trent is very likely to get those attacking returns and it might be one of the last game weeks I actually play him for because there's just so many double game week players coming forward isn't there uh, next up Luke Shaw against West Ham I think that's a reasonably good fixture for him and in general Manchester United have have managed to keep it fairly tight at the back, looking likely to get clean sheets all the time. And Manchester United fans and Manchester United defence owners perhaps a little bit unlucky to lose their clean point sheet, clean sheet points at the end of that Brighton game. So yeah, let's see what happens moving forward. But Manchester United, one of the very few teams that actually have been reliable 
couple of clean sheets recently. So let's see what they can provide for this game week as well. Luke Shaw, of course, despite playing at centre-back, is still going to be on those corners. So he still does have a little bit of creativity, a little bit of attacking threat, despite the fact he is playing in a slightly more reserved position. He's doing pretty well for bonus points as well at the moment, which is pretty nice to see. A clean sheet could potentially mean bonus points for Luke Shaw as well. And finally, at Purvis of Stupinian, another potential clean sheet here, to be fair. Against Everton at home, you would back a team like Brighton, who are reasonably good defensively, to keep a clean sheet against a team that does struggle to score goals. Uh, we've seen that consistently, and they do look like a team in trouble, Everton, at the moment. So Stupinian, not only is the clean sheet potential there, but Stupinian is just so attacking as well, constantly creating, taking shots, making runs in behind the defences as well. He's looked fantastic recently, and maybe even almost an essential player to own at the moment. He's just looked so, so good. So really, really happy to have Purvis of Stupinian in my team moving forward, and cannot wait for those double game weeks coming up for him. Into midfield, we've got Bruno Fernandes. Fernandes? I say Fernandes. I like saying Bruno Fernandes. Uh, yeah, he's uh, he's obviously scored a goal in game week 34, which was very nice. That was a long time coming. Also hit the post in that game, but he seems to do that every game. Um, yeah, Bruno Fernandes could have also got attacking returns in the game against Brighton. He's looked really, really good recently. Hasn't always got the FPL returns, but we have seen the last couple of game weeks. He's converting those great creative numbers, great shooting numbers into attacking returns in FPL as well. And he's going to be on penalties as well, and you never know when you're going to get a cheeky little penalty goal, as we saw it with McAllister and Salah and maybe a couple other players over recent weeks as well. Penalty takers are just useful players to have in general, and I'm very glad I've got one from Man Manchester United. If only they could get a few more penalties for Fernandes to take, that would be uh, nice. But yeah, West Ham, decent-ish fixture. I'd say it's a reasonably good fixture for Manchester United. So happy with the double up with Marcus Rashford as well, who has returned to a little bit of form recently, getting an assist and a goal in recent game week. So Hopefully we're going to see him back to his best. He's uh, constantly looking really good. And I'd like to see more of him playing as a central striker as well. I think he's been doing really well there whenever he's been given the opportunity. So expecting Manchester United to bounce back against West Ham. And I think Shaw, Fernandes and Rashford will all be very, very good picks for this game. Uh, next up, Alexis McAllister, the hero of my team last game week. He doesn't produce too much from open play recently because he's been playing a little bit deeper in the central defensive midfield position. And if I'm honest, I still do prefer Kaoru Mitoma to... McAllister here but at the same time you know, again, you never know when you're going to get lucky with a penalty. McAllister is creative and he does take shots on. He doesn't generate the highest quality chances, but he still is getting chances. And you imagine in a game where uh, Brighton are expected to beat Everton and score a couple of goals against Everton, you would imagine that McAllister could potentially be involved in that. He is that metronome in that Brighton team, creating for his teammates, uh, taking some free kicks, taking the penalties, taking the odd corner as well. And it's all looking pretty good in that respect. Uh, Fotsoli March is going to be the final player in midfield who again looked really good in the second game of the game week 34. First game he was absent for a lot of the time and then got the early substitution. So March was a disaster last game week. I'm not going to lie to you guys, but the positive signs were there. And when I saw him come on against Manchester United, I thought, wow, this is the guy. This is the guy who I bought. This is the guy who I hype up. This is what I like. And yes, he didn't get the attacking returns in the end. But boy, did he come close. Really close, in fact. So, yeah. March, uh, yeah. Let's see more of that. More of him driving forwards. You know, hanging around in the box. Taking plenty of shots on. Creating plenty for his teammates as well. He is still the most creative and the uh, best goal threat in the Brighton team still to this day. Uh, so yeah, long live Solly March. Let's see what he can do against Everton. I think now that he's had his rest, now McAllister has had his rest, now all of the Brighton players have kind of had a little bit of rest here and there. They should be good to hopefully play through till the end of the season. Now that's what I'm hoping and that's what I'm thinking too. Up front, we've got Erling Haaland up against Leeds, who is obviously kind of shouts out to us as a amazing pick for this game week. But there are concerns that now the goal score record has been broken and with Real Madrid uh, the next game for Manchester City being played on Tuesday there might be a case for Haaland to be actually rotated in this game so I, I'm, I'm not exactly sure I'm going to wait for early team news see what the situation is there but I think Haaland Grealish, these players are rotation risk, and I think we need to be aware of that and just uh, just kind of just uh, not not depend too much on him, I guess, which I know is very, very difficult to say. But I feel like if he doesn't start against Leeds, then there's a chance that he doesn't get any minutes. So maybe he's going to be a zero pointer, just 
come off for whoever's on my bench, potentially there, but it definitely does give us some questions about our transfers, and it gives us some questions about captaincy as well with that rotation. But that's something I want to talk about in just one moment. Let's finish off the team first. Diogo Jota against Brentford. I'm not 100% sure he's going to start. I can see a, a front three for Liverpool of Salah, Diaz and Darwin Nunez there as the three um, Liverpool forwards. It's just because Diogo Jota seems to have picked up another injury. It's not looking good uh, for him. It, it really has been an absolute failure of a punt on my behalf and it might be a situation I have to deal with. But we know that if he is playing and if he is on the pitch, he's going to be the primary goal-scoring threat for Liverpool. But you just can't guarantee him minutes. And with so few game weeks left, is that a risk I want to take or would I rather punt on something a little bit different with a little bit more information in my back pocket? I think maybe I do want to do that. And finally, Ollie Watkins, a player who a lot of people are selling right now in order to get other forwards. But yes, he has blanked the last few game weeks. It's been disappointing for Watkins. But Wolves are a team that have conceded goals recently. I'm not sure what's going to happen here because Wolves' home form is so much better than their away form. So it's really difficult to kind of say what's going to happen next. But Watkins, another player who is on penalties, which is very, very nice nice indeed and uh yeah it's just a game where you just feel like Aston Villa have been so good recently surely they're gonna win and if they do then surely Watkins is gonna be involved because certainly this year Watkins has been involved in pretty much everything and has perhaps been a little bit unlucky to blank in some of the recent game weeks maybe the games have been a little bit tougher for him uh aside from that Fulham game which I'm kind of a bit disappointed but that's in the past now we need to look forward uh Wolves and Spurs the next two fixtures uh, I'm hoping for a return to Watkins form if we don't see that it might be time to move him on in favor of some double game week players on the bench guys we've got Kepa like I kind of mentioned earlier but again I do think that Bournemouth will score against Chelsea. Chelsea's just not looking good right now. So yes, you might get save points from Kepa, but I don't think you're going to get the clean sheet, unfortunately. Martinelli against Newcastle is my first sub. I want to back the attacker on the bench, but against Newcastle, I'm not fully convinced. Newcastle are a fairly good defence. They only really concede one goal a game. And I don't know who that's gonna, who's going to score that goal. It's going to be Martinelli, Jesus, Erdegaard, Saka. It could be anyone in this Arsenal team, which is really, really difficult to predict, particularly when you're up against a team that doesn't score too many. It's always a bit of a risk there of which Arsenal player you're going to play and whether it's actually going to pay off or not. And Martinelli rotated last game. Whether that was a good or bad decision in the end, I, I'm not exactly sure. But Arsenal won the game comfortably without Martinelli. So maybe that's a suggestion that he's not as nailed on as we previously thought. Let's see, I guess. Uh, Trippier and Botman I've also got on the bench. I do think Arsenal would score because as much as I am not fully convinced by Arsenal at the moment, they will score goals. You know, they will concede goals, but they will also score goals. There's nothing wrong with the Arsenal attack right now say what you will about them say that they're bottling whatever it doesn't matter because they're still scoring goals and they're still looking really good in attack consistently and Newcastle like I say do concede the odd goal so Trippier I think there is a case to start with him I guess but looking at my defense who would I really bring Trippier on for I'm not really sure who would I bring Martinelli in for I'm not really sure I don't think I really need to play any of these players really and maybe just go without them this game week because it's a tough game for both Arsenal and Newcastle and they probably will cancel each other out anyway to be fair so there's no real winning I guess but there you go guys that is my team I've got some decisions to be made uh, let me tell you what my options are and then I'll kind of explain to you which one I'm thinking of uh, going for. So the first option is to just roll that transfer for her. I can play Jota if I want to. I can play Martinelli if I prefer him to Jota. I can even play Trippier if I don't want to play Jota or Martinelli. So I do have players that I can still play in this game week that I would be absolutely fine with playing. Absolutely fine with playing. It wouldn't really be a too much of an issue at all and I will be looking to get Newcastle attackers soon because I've got one Newcastle slot to use up. I've got one Manchester City slot to use up. So I am targeting Newcastle and Man City going forward. But if I don't make the transfer this game week, it gives me one more week of extra information and it allows me to buy Wilson or Isaac for double game week 36. And maybe in game week 37, I can pick a third Manchester City player to go for as well. Maybe even rolling that transfer that I've saved this game week all the way through till game week 38 and have two transfers in game week 38, which could be a real big advantage because we'll get lots of team news. We'll get lots of ideas of who has something to play for, who is likely to go full strength, who is likely to win and lose. And there's always plenty of goals on the final day of the season as well. So it might not be actually such a bad idea to roll that transfer all the way through to game week 38. But for me, it doesn't quite seem aggressive enough, particularly if I'm looking to close the gap and chase rank and break into the top 50k. So let's think of some other ideas. 
Now, another idea is Diogo Jota to Wilson. Now, I already know that I want to get either Wilson or Isaac in game week 36. So, is there any harm in doing that one game week early? Particularly when I quite like the Newcastle attackers against Arsenal. Arsenal lacking uh, defenders big time at the moment. We've got, uh, we've got Saliba, who's been out for a while. Gabriel potentially out as well this game week. It's going to be a, a, a difficult situation where a bad Arsenal defence could get even worse up against a Newcastle attack who have been scoring for fun recently. They've been scoring so many goals, and Wilson right now, per minute it's played, he's just an absolute killer. He's doing so, so well on penalties as well. There's so much to go well for Wilson at the moment, as long as he's on the pitch. So we'd be, what we'd be doing is we'd be making a, an assumption that Wilson is going to start against Arsenal. And to be fair, Wilson is usually rotated and protected just in case he gets injured. That's why he doesn't get a lot of minutes. But now going through to the end of the season, there's only five games left for Newcastle. What are they saving him for at this point? They need to secure that top four position. They can do that in the next couple of games. I imagine they will go full strength uh, against Arsenal because once Arsenal is out the way that's a really good situation you never know Newcastle could even leapfrog Arsenal and go into second stranger things have happened in football so yeah I feel like this is a really really good pick to go for it's a pick that a lot of people are frozen out of as well a lot of people already tripled up on Newcastle can't easily get Wilson so even though Wilson seems like a really popular transfer this game week and it is a reasonably safe transfer as well what I would say is that it is a bit differential as well because not everyone is going to be able to do this not everyone is going to be willing to do this a lot of people who just assume Arsenal is a difficult fixture when I don't believe it is and I say that as an Arsenal fan uh, but Wilson yeah it could be a really good pick and finally Diogo Jota to Alvarez could be on as well and I really like this as a differential really like this uh, this will be early team news dependent so we are hoping because Man City play the first game of game week 35 we are hoping and expecting that we will get some early team news from Man City and get a good idea of who is starting and who isn't and I feel like Alvarez up against uh, Leeds at home could be a real high upside punt every time Alvarez starts games he seems to absolutely dominate his oppositions particularly when we're looking at at some of the weaker defences, such as Leeds United. So I think there's a really high upside here if we go for Alvarez. And I think he's a captain option as well. And this is particularly if Erling Haaland does get his rest. If Erling Haaland gets his rest, that means Alvarez is going to be the main central striker. And if he's the main central striker against Leeds for Manchester City, who score so many goals, create so much, he's going to be a captain option as well. And I genuinely feel like if Erling Haaland is not playing, I, will, I won't sell him. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to sell Haaland. But I would still be looking to captain a forward in that Manchester City game. And if it's not going to be Haaland because he's not starting the game, well, who else? Well, Alvarez. It seems like to be the second best option. If everyone's playing, it's got to be Alvarez. You can maybe throw in De Bruyne in there as well if we know he's starting. And I think De Bruyne will start in that game, by the way, guys. I think he will. But again, we'll find out nearer the time. But yeah, I think this is a, a really good option. Team news dependent. And it's going to be a down to a case of if Erling Haaland is not playing against Leeds or not starting against Leeds, then I'm going to go for Alvarez. I'm going to buy Alvarez. I'm going to do Jota to Alvarez. It's going to be a really easy decision for me as a Jota owner because Jota is a risky kind of, we're not sure about him anyway. If you've got the likes of Watkins or Tony or Kane or whoever else, it's much harder to make the decision of going for a Wilson or going for an Alvarez. So again, that's another differential because uh, not a lot of other people can afford to make this kind of transfer. And I believe I can. Moving one punt to another punt rather than filling my team with punts, if that makes sense. So yeah, I think this move is definitely potentially on, but it is so dependent on that early team news. And I can't tell you the answer to that one now. We were going to have have to find out right until you know five ten minutes before deadline before I'm committing to uh, the decision of Alvarez. So with that said, because I can't tell you anything about the Alvarez move, let's lock lick lock in lick lock in. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> it's been a long week, guys. I'm going to lock in a different transfer, and that's going to be Jota to Wilson. So if everything else fails, I feel like I will go for this one. Particularly if Erling Haaland is starting, or we don't get any early team news, I think Wilson could be the one because I'd like to take him through to double game week. 
36 as well. It frees up a little bit of money in my bank as well, which is always very, very nice indeed, where we can make some upgrades elsewhere in my team for the final few game weeks. And I feel like this team looks pretty good recent, uh, really, and it is prepared for the following game week as well. So, yeah, I'm not sure 100%. I'll tell you the truth, guys, at this moment. I don't know which transfer I'm going to make. I think a lot of people are waiting for early Man City team news before committing to any plan. I am no different to that, but for now, I think Jota to Wilson looks like a good placeholder move, to be fair, if I can't make any other moves. So, let's see, guys. Let's see. We'll find out tomorrow afternoon, I suppose. Now, finally, captaincy. For the time being, Erling Haaland gets the captain's armband against Leeds. It's an absolute no-brainer as far as I'm concerned. There's no uh, better option if he's starting in that game. You do expect him to score goals, don't you? Uh, vice captain, I'm going to put on Bruno Fernandes, but to be honest, I'm not convinced by anyone uh, as my kind of vice captain, which is why I am so convinced that I am going to make the Alvarez move because I don't think I have another captain option really, or at least not one that I'm fully confident in. And when I'm talking about the captain armband, I want to be confident in who I'm going to be captaining. I want to be enthusiastic about it. I'm not really enthusiastic about anyone outside of Erling Haaland, Alvarez. I guess maybe I'd be enthusiastic about De Bruyne as well, potentially. Uh, outside shot for Salah, maybe, just because he's a premium and has been so reliable historically. Although his numbers are down, but you get those penalties at least. So it's really, really difficult. So, yeah, Haaland is going to be the captain. Uh, if, if Haaland is not playing in that game... It would be really nice to have Alvarez as a backup option, though. I'm going to tell you that one for true. Uh, but there we go, guys. That is my team for Game Week 35. I think things are coming together quite nicely. Thanks for watching today, guys. If you did enjoy, please do drop a like, do subscribe if you're new around here as well. Don't forget to check out some of the other Game Week 35 content that I dropped on my channel. There's plenty. I've done loads. I did a video on differentials as well as a bit of a random new video that I just do now and again. If you want to check out some of my differential picks that might help you project your rank upwards and onwards, beat your mini league rivals, uh, do go check that out. Uploaded that a couple of days ago. But aside from that, guys, I'm going to leave it there. See you tomorrow on stream. Thank you so much for watching once again, and I will see you later, mate. Bye-bye.